And it's so hard for me to talk to people about it because it's one of those things where unless you experience it, you don't understand. And that's where I come in as a photographer. I try and let the people that don't get the opportunity to experience the natural world to experience it. I've been able to go canoeing in the Great Zambezi River in Zimbabwe, and I've come face to face with elephants while doing so. I've gone hiking with the Samburu people in Kenya, which has been one of my favorite uh, experiences in my whole life. And I've also been able to cable cart across the border between South Africa and Botswana with crocodiles swimming underneath me. <laughs> I've also been able to experience the true beauty found in the Ngorogoro Crater in Tanzania, which is my favorite place in the entire world. Now, since the name of the talk is called Close Encounters, I thought it would only be right if I shared some of my close encounters with you. And with this picture in particular, it was after a morning game drive, I wanted to try out macro lens for the first time. And for those of you that might not know, it's to take pictures of small insects or very up close things. So for example, people's eyes, if you've seen any pictures on that. So with regards to taking this picture, it was one of those things where I went to go get my camera to go and try out, see where, what, I, what I could take pictures of, because it's insects, they're everywhere. And that's when I saw this orange blur run past me. I wasn't sure what it was at the beginning, but then after I got my camera and went after it, a solifuge, which is what this creature's name is, started chasing me, because they chase after people's shadows. So it's quite an experience. After chasing after me and me running away, I eventually found out that if I stayed still and lie down, it would come up to me and I could get the photo that I wanted. So with this, I got the photo and as it came closer, because I leopard called up to it, it flared its pincers in almost a type of like get away from me, which I did. But I got the photo I wanted to show what it's like to be on the praise perspective in this type of picture. Straight after this, I looked at the picture on the LCD, which is the camera screen, and I realized that when I looked up, it was gone. And that's when I felt something crawling up my leg. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can imagine, I was glad I was wearing khaki that day. Um, needed a change of pants afterwards. <laughs> but that's just one of my experiences. Another one, which I like to talk to you about, is the time I was charged by a leopard. Tortoise. <laughs> <laughs> so with this sighting in particular, we went to a place called Mashati Game Reserve, which is where I do a lot of my photography as I've been going there for two months for the last eight years. And I wanted to go to one of my favorite hills in the area to experience the sunset and to talk about what we had seen with my family. With this sighting in particular, I saw a rock and I thought, whatever, it's just a rock. It's so rocky in the area that I paid no attention to it. But then as the day went on, we started talking, the sun was setting, I realized that the rock had moved. And that's when I thought, you know what, let me, let me go and find out what's going on. So I walked up and tried to investigate and that's when I saw this leopard tortoise. So immediately I ran to go get my camera to capture the last rays of the setting sun. And I got the picture that you see behind me now. To get this though, it's not, it's not a nice story. <laughs> Uh, I had to go crawling around all over the rocks and stuff and ended up going on top of a thorn bush so to get this photo. But it was all worth it because even though I had a whole bunch of cuts and I was impaled one or two times, I got the shots I wanted. So that's all that matters. Now I've talked to you about the smaller creatures that I've been able to have encounters with, but I've also had encounters with equally as large creatures like the elephants and the lions. And the reason I brought up the whole point of talking about the smaller creatures is a lot of people don't pay attention to them. And it's one of the most important things I've found that people should say, have a bit of focus on them because the one thing with photography, you don't need to go to Africa to go and take photos. You can go into your back garden. You know, there's always something you can do. But carrying on with my story, with this photo in particular, I came face to face with the crocodile. We drifted down the river in the Okavango Delta and I managed to get this shot. And although it seems really close, I was closer. <laughs> I've come face to face with big male lions and I've also been in such a close proximity to two big bulls fighting over a female that I couldn't actually take photos of them anymore because it was too close, I couldn't focus. With all that being said, I think it's only right to begin from the really beginning. And with that being said, this is my story. From the day I was born, nature and wildlife photography had always been a big part of my life as my parents were always involved with wildlife photography and were very passionate about the bush. As far back as I can remember, I was going to our local game reserves and taking photos of everything. 
and I always remember asking my dad if I could borrow his camera, because, and he would always reluctantly respond with, okay, but don't drop it, because if you do, we're gonna feed you to the lions. <laughs> so as such, I'd make sure that no matter what, I wouldn't drop his camera. During this journey of learning how to get into this photography and what photography really was, because I was always fascinated with my, what my dad could do with the camera and take what we saw in front of us and put it into a little screen, I eventually, after whining and whining for seven years, got my very first camera, and which I like to call the pocket rocket. So the pocket rocket, I actually brought it here today, was the first camera that I ever owned. It's exclusive to me, and it was something that I took everywhere. I remember going to our local game reserves and taking pictures of everything. And when I mean everything, I mean everything. <laughs> With one picture in particular, which was one of my first pictures I ever took, was of an Inyala, and it's not very good, it's blurry, it's, yeah, I don't like to look at it very much. <laughs> but I look at it now because it shows where I come from and how I've progressed as a photographer as well as a person. Now with that being said, yeah, it's a nice picture, <laughs> I took it. <laughs> so with this, as I was growing older with my wildlife photography, I started to realize that I wanted to share with my memories with what I saw with my friends and family, and I wanted to capture them as photos. To do this, I'd obviously go to the game reserves and take photos, but I realized somewhere along the line that that wasn't enough for me. I wanted to capture what I thought the true beauty of nature was, and to share it with the world, because as I said previously, a lot of people don't get to experience what it's like to go into the bush, to see a giraffe like this. And that was my goal as a photographer, was to bring the bush to the people, not the people to the bush. I remember when my dad always said, as I was a youngster, that animals aren't gonna be around forever and that you must take the most of every experience you get, no matter how big or small the opportunity, because they're not gonna be there today forever. And the animals you photograph today might not be there tomorrow. So as a youngster, as a little 10-year-old, I didn't really understand what he was trying to say. But as I grew older, I started to realize and with this picture in particular, it's of an elephant that's been shot in the, crossing the border of South Africa and Botswana during the dry season. It was shot and ravaged for its skin, for the black market. And after seeing this, it made me realize what I wanted to do with my photography. To not only share what I thought the beauty of nature was with the world, but to show, to raise awareness for how the animals in our world aren't gonna be around forever. And that if we don't make the change, change won't happen. I remember specifically going through my story, going through as I grew older, his words kept on ringing a bell in my head. I always had it at the back of my head, talking about why we should be protecting animals. And as a youngster, I didn't understand this, but slowly through, it reminded me, it gave me the sense that the lines were fading from our world and vanishing, disappearing off the frame. And with that, it won the uh, under 14 category at a competition called the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards, which when I came, it was the under 14 category, and I placed in 2014 as an 11 year old. To this day, lions have been one of my favorite uh, animals to photograph, and there's a big passion of mine to protect them, as you can see by the pictures I've taken behind me. This is on one of my last trips to Botswana. Now, you may be wondering what this Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition is that I previously mentioned. And in the words of myself, it's the Mount Everest of wildlife photography. There's no higher place. Um, it's a competition where there's over 45,000 entrants from all over the world, and it's exhibited in the Natural History Museum in London. It's a competition where the top 100 pictures get selected and will be exhibited in London and tour the world. And it's to raise awareness for both the population of the world's wildlife and as well just show showcasing the beauty of nature and why we should be protecting it. During this experience, I, had the, I was fortunate enough to meet Sir David Attenborough, who actually signed my first book as I made as a 13-year-old at the time. So that was really a special moment for me and one that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Throughout all of this, I've been able to get the award of my dreams and my dream came true when I won the Young Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award this year, well, last year now, time flies. Now, before I go on to talking about what the picture won, how I won, I thought I'd like to mention how it all started. So this was during when we went to Kenya for my mom's 40th birthday, and we went with a photographer called 
Greg Detoy. Now he's the wildlife photographer of the year for 2013. And I was so fascinated with what he could do with the camera that I stuck to him like Velcro. And I was so inspired and excited by what he could do and what he called this job, because I thought it was more like a holiday. Uh, so I wanted to learn as much as I could from him. And I remember asking him about a picture that I took uh, when I was 11 years old. And straight after I asked him what he thought about it, he went up to me and he said, Ska, look at this competition and show my parents the wildlife photographer of the year. And he told me, in a couple of years' time, when I'm an adult, I might have the potential to place in the competition. But to his dismay, I made it the next year. <laughs> and this is me and Greg in London. So just, I can see I'm already short on time, so I'm going to do a bit of a skip action. The whole point of my photography shifted when I realized that I hadn't made it into the competition for four years. Because after I took my original shot of Vanishing Lion, I entered each year, and to no avail, I didn't place anywhere. I realized that I was missing something, and that some of my pictures placed and others not. And what this was, was I needed to make people feel something. I needed to evoke an emotion, a feeling. And that's when it all dawned on me that I just needed to change my perspective, and that the common shouldn't be seen as mundane. And that with a change of perspective, you can even see a baboon, or a bird, or a zebra, as something super extraordinary, if given the right approach. And that you don't need to see exotic things, you just have to have an exotic approach. A picture I liken this to is a picture called Dawn of the Beast, which is of a wildebeest actually doing, uh, making a poo. It's, it doesn't sound very photogenic, does it? But it's a picture that I saw an opportunity to make look as best as I could and to showcase that even though it's a common thing, it's beautiful. So now the picture that won the whole Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards is called Lounging Leopard. It's a picture of a leopard I've been following for the last eight years and I've actually been fortunate enough to grow alongside her from just older than a cub to having a second litter now. Um, I've been able to photograph her since I first started my photography journey and have been able to grow alongside her. So it's been a really awesome experience for me, especially with this photo being my winner. I've taken this photo, this leopard in particular is very special to me, not only because of how long I've been taking photos of her. She broke her leg as a cub, and as a cub, a leopards like to drag their kills up trees, but she couldn't do this because of her injured leg. But through a miracle, she somehow managed to survive, and to this day is doing really well. So this is her cub. I've recently just taken photos of her. They're both beautiful. I love them. To summarize my whole talk, I'd like to say that the youth play a very important role in conservation especially, because whether we like it or not, the previous generations haven't left the youth with much to do. We have to fix a lot of things, and the thing is we don't have the experience or the knowledge to fix them, which is why I believe that if all of us work together, we can actually make a difference. And that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed my story. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anywhere you want, either there or there. Thank you very much, Sky. That was great. Uh, now I have the honor to introduce Dr. Jane Goodall. Not that she needs an introduction. You know, at National Geographic, we, show, we see our role as helping people make the world a better place to really understand the world. And nobody has embodied this more, really, in the last 50 or 60 years than Dr. Jane Goodall. Um, about 55 years ago, Jane, and I hope you don't mind if I call you Jane because we all think of you as Jane because we all feel like we know you so well from seeing you over the years on television. Uh, you know, Jane, Jane set foot on the shores of what today is Tanzania's Gombe National Park to begin her pioneering chimpanzee behavioral study. It forever changed uh, our understanding of great apes and our relationship with animals. In the last five decades, her message has evolved into a personal quest to empower others to make the world a better place for all living things. In 1977, Jane established the Jane Goodall Institute, and today JGI has expanded around the globe, continuing research at Gombe and implementing innovative community-centered conservation projects. Since the late 80s, Jane has been traveling around the world, speaking out about conservation. As she says, 
Only if we understand will we care. Only if we care will we help. Only if we help shall all be saved. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jane Goodall. You know about him. I don't know about him. Tell me about him. Well, he's one of my symbols of hope because he was given to me by a man who went blind at 21, decided to become a magician. Um, everyone said, you can be a magician if you're blind. He said, I can try. The children don't know he's blind. And at the end, he'll tell them and say, if something goes wrong, and it might, don't give up. There's always a way forward. He's just taught himself to paint, never painted before. And he gave me this 28 years ago, thinking it was a chimpanzee. Well, and, close. <laughs> so he said, never mind, take him where you go. And I'm with you in the spirit. So he's been to 64 countries. Wow, well, we uh, are so honored to have. He's very famous. Does he have a name? Mr. H. Mr. H. Gary Horn, Mr. H. OK, well, Mr. H, we're glad you could join us uh, here today for this conversation. And before we get started, I did want to mention that behind us, Jane, these are some pictures that you picked out as, you know, um, a, pictures of, of your career and different places that you've been, but that Jane specifically uh, picked out these, these pictures as being some of the most uh, important to her. So I guess one of the things that I want to know is you've spent so much time, obviously, among chimpanzees and for so long. Do you, what questions do you still have about their behavior? that you feel like haven't been answered? Well, I think one of the most fascinating things is the fact that in different parts of their range, they have different behaviors. And we're still working out some of that is because of the environment, but also they, they have their own sort of culture, like we now know other animals too. So if you define cultures, behavior pass from one generation to the next through observation, imitation, and practice. You watch the infants watching. And so, for example, you may have the same fruit in two different places. In one area, it's eaten. In another area, it's not. And you can actually see the mothers hitting it away if an infant tries. So they have these cultural behaviors as well. And we need to know as much as we can because so many of these groups are gone. So many of the, the different chimp gone. families are gone. Do you know that, like, for example, at Gombe, the chimps make a nest every night. They wouldn't dream of leaving their nests at night. In Senegal, where JGI is working, uh, it's so hot that the chimpanzees have learned to forage at night when there's a full moon. In Uganda, where the, the habitat is more like Gombe, they're foraging at night because they've been pushed back and back by the local people, them, you know, taking over more forest. So they've learned to forage on crops, and it's safer at night. Well, so they're just making adaptations the way any of us would to exactly. our culture. And nobody believed that that was possible. And do you feel like, I mean, I guess that sort of leads to my next question, which is, you know, what do you wish that more people knew about the natural world? Well, I think, you know, like the photographs we've just seen, there are photographers, uh, there are artists, there are painters, uh, writers, all talking about the natural world. It's also important we have a youth program, which is now in nearly 80 countries, Roots and Shoots, and we have our young people go out very often with GPS, and they, they map the city. You'd be amazed at the wildlife within a city. It's, it, it's, it's everywhere. And so now they're beginning to create corridors linking up one patch of, you know, with a little bit of wilderness left. And so spreading wildlife through the city. I mean, so is it your sense that people just are unaware of the wildlife that is actually around them wherever they live? Yes, because unfortunately our young people today spend nearly all their time in a virtual world and on the, I mean, you know, look at them on a bus. They're not looking out of the window. They're not seeing beautiful sunsets. They're, they're texting each other. Well, I wouldn't just blame that on the young people, actually. Pretty much everybody, it seems yeah, like. Yeah, I know, but the young people are not having experience in nature, which they need for proper psychological development. It's been shown. You know, that actually leads to, to the next area I wanted to talk to you about. So you've had this amazing career. You've done so many things. Lots of us feel like 
you know, we grew up watching, watching your work. When you look back on, on all the things you've done, what were the, some of the happiest moments of your career? I think one of the really happiest moments was illustrated in one of those pictures when the mother of little Flint trusted me sufficiently to let her precious baby come up and reach out to touch me. And that was, you know, it was like, yes, I've really been accepted now. And another when the old male David Greybeard, who was the first one to accept me, and I handed him this palm nut uh, on the palm of my hand because chimps love them. And he turned away, so I put my hand closer. He reached out, he took and dropped the nut. Must have been something wrong with it. But very gently squeezed my fingers. And that's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So in, in that moment, we communicated in a gestural language that must have predated human speech. And you felt for the first time that they had sort of accepted you in being there. Well, they did in the end. It was almost like I wasn't part of the group, but I was part of the environment and no more to be feared than a baboon. So if you had a magic wand and you could change overnight one thing um, about the way that we treat animals and think about animals, what would it be? <clears throat> when I first got to Cambridge, because Leakey told me I had to get a degree, I hadn't been to college, and there I am landed doing a PhD. I'd been two years with the chimps, and the professors told me I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. I couldn't talk about them having personalities, minds, or emotions. Those were unique to us. There was a difference in kind between us up on an elevated platform and all the others down there. Thanks to the chimps being so biologically like us as well as behaviorally like us, they really helped me break down that narrow reductionist way of thinking. And today, it's accepted by more and more that animals too have personalities, minds, and emotions. They can feel happy, sad, despair. And it's not just the chimpanzees and the wildlife whose photos you saw. It's the cows and the pigs that we're eating and cramming into these horrible things. So what would I like to change? I would like people to understand that all animals have a personality and individuality, and that they can feel happy, sad, they can feel pain. And we need to treat them with much greater respect. I mean, if you, if you think a little, oh, look, there you are. And, uh, that, he was my teacher. Who, now he, tell me, who is Rusty. that dog? That's Rusty. Now, Rusty was with me in my childhood. When the professors told me I'd done everything wrong, although I was scared of them, this was my teacher. And he had already taught me when I was a child that in this respect, the professors were wrong. You couldn't have a greater personality than this. High intelligence mm -hmm. and certainly had his moods. Well, it always makes me laugh when we talk about training dogs because I really think dogs train us. But, um, you know, it seems like some, in some aspects, your career has taken you on a track from a naturalist to an educator to an activist. And, you know, even getting involved in the um, debate going on in Wyoming about shooting grizzly bears. Oh, this is, I think, Jane, the picture that you were talking about, yes. right? Yes, yes, little Flint. Mm -hmm. Look at those eyes looking up at me. And this wonder, this awe that you see in animals as well as humans. So fantastic. Mm -hmm. So is that how you feel now? Do you feel like you're an activist on behalf of animals? How would you describe? Well, I'm an, uh, yeah, I am indeed an activist on behalf of animals. But the interesting thing is when I went to learn more about what was happening to chimpanzees, the destruction of the forests, which, of course, if we lose the forests, we lose all that rich biodiversity. And realizing as I learn more and more in different parts of Africa that the problems facing many of the African people were shocking, the crippling poverty, the lack of good health and education. When I flew over Gombe, it used to be part of that great equatorial forest belt and that was in 1960 and 1970. 1990, it was a tiny island, 35 square kilometers, that's all it is, surrounded by completely bare hills, people struggling to survive, more than the land could support. And that's when it hit me. If we don't do something to help the people and alleviate this crippling poverty, we can't even try to save wildlife. 
And so we began this program, which is now in six different African countries. Around Gombe now, if you fly over it, there's no bare hills anymore. Mm. The forest has come back. And people are beginning to understand saving the forest isn't just about uh, preserving wildlife. It's their own future. We need the forests for the clean air and the clean water. And the rate at which particularly tropical, but all forests are going, is one of the major causes of climate change mm -hmm. because they absorb the CO2, they give out oxygen, and they're being cut down, and even the CO2 in the forest floor is being released. So, I mean, this is just a great example of, you know, one of the many walls that you've hit that you've either gone around or climbed over. I mean, I know a very Early in your career, you felt you weren't, well, you've talked about it a lot, you weren't taken seriously, they didn't believe your research, you were a girl, you were, you know, they said all that thing. So when you hit these difficult points and you're ha trying to tackle so many hard issues, when you get discouraged, how do you get over that hump? Well, one, you've got a great team, and of course, originally it was my mother, who was my terrific supporter, um, and I'm an obstinate kind of person. And the more I get hit, the more it's like one of those Russian dolls. I say, <laughs> I, I'm not going to let you defeat me. And, you know, we can look around the world today and see what's happening, and see some of these figures who reared up and they're harming the environment and harming society and risking war. And we can't actually go and fight them, but we can grow around them, grow a strong base of young people in our Roots and Truths program growing up who will take their places, who will have different values, who will respect the environment. Well, and I think we've heard from a young person like that today, and we're going to have a conversation with him in a minute. But I think the first thing we wanted to do, you brought with you a video that we were going to show, and then the three of us will have a chat. So to introduce the video briefly, uh, chimpanzee mothers are shot uh, sometimes for bushmeat, sometimes to sell the infants overseas for entertainment or so. So you can't put these babies back in the forest. We have sanctuaries. The biggest one in Africa is our JGI sanctuary in Congo, Chimpunga. And uh, we're trying to release all of the chimps onto these forested islands. So when you see this video, what I'd like you to remember is that this is the first day I met this particular chimpanzee. And the video says it all, but this is the first day I met her. I think what happened when she was let out into the island is maybe the most amazing thing that's happened in my whole life. Okay. And I want you to watch it and try and feel how it must have been to be there and see this happening. Let's take a look. This is a really exciting moment for me. The Jane Goodall Institute's Chimpunga Chimpanzee Rehabilitation Center in the Republic of Congo has for years been caring for infants whose mothers were killed, mostly for the illegal bushmeat trade. Many of them are now fully grown. Recently, we acquired three large forested islands on the beautiful Quilu River, where we can release many of the chimpanzees from our overcrowded center. In here is Wunda, and she nearly died, but thanks to Rebecca, she came back from the dead. And here she is, about to come out into this paradise. She's the 15th chimpanzee to get her freedom here. And we hope, ultimately, to have about 60 on the island. Today is the first time I've met Wunda. I talked to her on the boat, trying to reassure her. She must have wondered what was happening. None of us could predict exactly what she would do once the cage door opened. It was a very, very touching moment. One of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. The warmth of her embrace is something I shall never forget. 
for Wunda and all the other chimpanzees we're working to bring here, Chinzula Island will provide a wonderful forest home where they will be cared for and safe. Well, that is amazing, and um, there's probably not a dry eye in the house. <laughs> At least that's how I feel. So I'm going to try it rather than Nobody's trying. Doing this, you're right. I know, I know. My goodness. Um, so, Sky, let me just start with you. What would you want to ask Jane Goodall? You've, you know, you've <laughs> heard her talking here. You know all about her. You've seen this amazing video. What's your question for Jane? I have to dry I'd my eyes. I'd just like to say that it's such an honor to meet you, and I've looked at your story through since. I first started going into nature conservation and it's just been inspiring and to see that video. I think all of us can easily say that's one of the most touching things that we've seen. But for me, in a day and age where my generation, we're young, we're very tech savvy, we don't go and experience nature. So the question I'd ask is how can we try and change that and change people's perspective of the nature is worth something that we should be trying our best and doing everything we can to be a part of, to accept, to be like, to, you know, to save it at the end of the day. Well, that's really why I began the Roots and Toots program in 1991. And it began with high school students. Now it's kindergarten, university, and everything in between. And one of the things we try to do, particularly with the younger children in school, is to make sure either that they can get out into nature, not Africa or places like yeah. that, unless they're in Africa, but um, you know, just into some park or botanical gardens. Uh, and even if we can't do that, because sometimes it's really difficult in very poor areas to get children out, but we can bring nature into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so children need to feel the dirt. And it's quite fun. We've got a lot of children doing organic gardens. And when I go to the kindergartners, I can't tell you how many times they open their, their vermiculture and they reach in among all their filthy leftover food to put these little worms in my head. These little worms are changing the food in so that things can grow. Um, so, so they're studying spiders and birds and they're using GIS, GPS, so you can bring technology in. Okay. And we just do whatever we can. Yeah, because I think it's really important with the whole way that technology is evolving to still keep it so that we can take the advantages of technology but also bring it into keeping yeah. nature the way it is. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's very... It should be the best of both and worlds. Yeah. Don't go around saying any more what you said today that um, in so many years these animals won't be here because we're not going to let it happen. <laughs> Correct. Okay, I think I think that you're on on, on board with that, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally, right? <laughs> now, Jane, if you were uh, Sky's age, what do you think you'd what do you think you'd be doing now? If I was his age? Yeah. <laughs> now today? Yeah. I haven't the remotest idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm sure it would you see I might be a different person, but if I was the person I was living now, it would certainly be something to do with animals. And you know, I can't help saying, I'm sure many of you saw the movie Jane, the geographic film, and that amazing photography. My husband, Hugo, who shot that film, he was like you as a child. He went out to nature, he had his little, I think it was a box, a box brownie to start with, you know, <laughs> long before your time. And so he too had a passion for photography mm -hmm. from a very, very young age. Well, that's a good endorsement, yeah, yeah. I would say. Um, all right, I've got a question here from, uh, from somebody out there, and we're gonna also open up to the audience here. But the question for, is for Sky, actually, and it's, Sky, what do you love most about photography? 
I feel like the, I have so much to talk about when I say I love photography, but in particular, the reactions that people have when they see my photos is, as I said, they don't get to see what nature is. And I like to show people what nature is. And just like that wow factor and the fact that I'll feel good that I made someone else feel good by looking at this animal. And I've also at the same time made them feel passionate about that animal and saying they can now do, they can choose what they want to do, but at least in the back of their mind, they have that feeling that, yes, we can fight against this if something goes wrong. Yes, we can change it. We're not going to let them die out. Mm -hmm. So that's for me, yeah. Well, it, you know, it sounds actually like you have a lot in common, both being, um, you know, passionate about raising awareness so much. And Jane, here's a question for you. Uh, what influenced you most in your career? Uh, what influenced me most in my career? I was 10 years old. Of course, when I was 10, there was not even any television. So it was books. Also, World War II was raging at the time. And I don't think children's books were made then. I'm sure they weren't. But I found this little second-hand bookshop. We, we didn't have any money anyway. And I found this little book. I'd saved up just enough of my pennies of pocket money to buy it. I still have it. It's this big. And it was called Tarzan of the Apes. I took it home, I read it from cover to cover, fell passionately in love with this glorious lord of the jungle, and what did Tarzan do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very jealous of her. Uh, well, I, of course I knew that there wasn't uh, a Tarzan, but that's when my dream began. I will go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. So I was influenced by Tarzan. I was influenced by Dr. Doolittle. Um, I was, those really, it was books that influenced me the most. Mm -hmm. Probably my dog, too. Well, and it sounds like, Sky, your biggest influence now is what you're seeing through that viewfinder and how you can use that to yeah, activate. Like, as I've said, my parents have always been so passionate about wildlife, and they wanted to show me, the pictures that they've taken, the things that they've seen. And I've always wanted to do that for my children, my grandchildren. So I'm just really chuffed that I get the opportunity to take photographs. And I think it's something that a lot of people my age don't think, let's take a photo. So for me to be able to do that is just mind blowing and I'm very grateful for it. I think it would be great if you became involved in Roots and Shoots because then you could share your knowledge and your passion with our 80 countries around oh, the world. Well, I'd love to. <laughs> okay. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. Well, this is Davos. We've struck a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to ask you both the same question because you both mentioned it in different ways, and that's how do we get younger people to really appreciate and actually go outside more? And first, Jane, let me ask you. I, I really answered it, didn't I? You well, know, we tried with tried roots and shoots, they, right? Because if they don't, if they don't actually get out there, uh, they're never going to appreciate it. You started off with that quote: "Only if we understand can we care, and if we care, will we help? Only if we help, shall all be saved." And so, any way we can to get young children out into nature, any way we can. Well, let me ask then somebody who probably occasionally needs to get pried out away from his devices. <laughs> um, do you think that we can get people to look up uh, and to see? I think that we definitely can. The question is how it's not going to be easy, though. With the way that technology is integrated into our society as a whole, especially at my school, I've invited people to go and see some of the best places in the world for wildlife and to experience nature, and even not even that, just to go to our botanical gardens and stuff. And they say, no, the reception's bad. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I disconnect myself from my device whenever I go into nature. And obviously on the drive, uh, the drive here, I looked at the mountains and stuff. But I feel like people aren't going to take, it's quite, it's conflicting because in order for people to understand why they should go into and experience nature, we have to use technology to show them why they should go into nature. So it's one of those things where me as a photographer, my goal is to inspire the people to go and experience nature for themselves, but I also rely on technology to do that. It's interesting, you know, 
just uh, last night, no, the night before, last night I was in a plane, um, I was having dinner with some people in, in Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. and there's this young uh, Emirati, and she said, she, was, she asked the same question, how do we get these young people out into nature? She said, well, they're all you know, dependent on their smartphones and things. So, okay, so she made a game, and you, you, can, you actually go out, you check where certain wildlife is, you record that you've seen it. If you get enough points, then you can be taken to a very exotic place. So she's making a game yeah. using the technology and we're hoping, I mean, I only heard about it last night before last. So yeah, no, let's give it I a think life. it's exciting. And she's just developing it now. Yeah, no, that's definitely one way to do it because the thing is with technology, there's so many different ways you can reach out. Um, with those live streaming of the water holes, a lot of my friends, I play it during class um, when we're not doing work. <laughs> well, just, just to cover that one. Um, yeah, so I, I like to do that, and then I show, hey, look, there's an elephant, and then I go, oh, wow. And then I tell them a bit about an elephant. They get interested in an elephant. They look up the elephant. And now I've actually been fortunate enough to take a family a friend of mine up into the bush to see wildlife for the first time. And I've never seen someone as happy in my life just to be a part of nature for the first time and to disconnect. That's fantastic, and it might take some of those innovative mm -hmm. solutions to, to get it to happen. But we took, we took a, young, uh, a young man from very inner city, very poor area, lots of crime. I think it was Boston. And he brought his little group to join some roots and shoots, and we took them onto the river in little boats. You should have seen those kids from this inner city slum area. They'd never seen anything, and by the end they were fishing things out with their net, they were looking at them. They didn't want to leave, and they'd never, ever seen nature before. I am afraid we are gonna to have to wrap this up, but I just wanted to ask one more question of you, Jane, and it's, you know, how, what do you want your legacy to be? How do you want people to remember you and your work that you've done? It's been so impactful and so important. I think two ways. One, helping people to understand animals as individuals, with each one matters and has a role to play. Uh, and, you know, we stop thinking of them in numbers and as mere things that we can do with as we will. So that's one, I think, because of the chimps and Rusty, are, I, I've really broken down a barrier there. And secondly, starting Roots and Shoots. Mm -hmm. Because in Roots and Shoots, what I didn't say is, the, each group, we don't tell them what to do, they choose. So it's not top down. And depending on the country they're in, the culture, the religion, the rich, poor, whatever, uh, they choose different projects. But one is to help people, one is to help animals, one is to help the environment. And so it's like nature, everything is interconnected and they're linked with each other around the globe and they're beginning to understand the color of your skin, your culture, what you eat. It doesn't really matter because inside we have the same human heart, our blood is the same, our tears are the same. We are a family. And if we can't stop this fighting, this terrible, terrible fighting that's going on now in so many parts of the world, um, there's what future for you talk about your grandchildren? So it's not just the animals we're losing out on right now. It's our future in so many ways. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And with the individuality, I know we're short on time. The leopard I've taken uh, photographs of for the last eight years, um, her name's Limpy, as I said, because of her broken leg. And I've also been asked questions, 